and welcome to Hospice Insights, The Law and Beyond, where we connect you to what matters in the ever-changing world of hospice and palliative care. The gifts that keep on giving, TPE insights and strategies. Brian. Hey, Meg. We're still talking about TPE, I think, in preparing for this. It's like, how many podcasts over the years have we recorded on TPE? And just as a tickler, our 100th episode is coming up here wow. at HB in October. So, wow, a mi- it's quite a milestone. Yeah, yeah. stay tuned <laughs> for fun. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Hopefully, not more TPE podcasts no, no. before like, then, but <laughs> marketing's working on something fun for our <laughs> listeners. Um, but, but now on to serious business of TPE. And um, I, I think why we wanted to do this episode, not that. TPE is new or whatever, but I think really to provide some thoughts on potential strategies and talk about some tools that we have available for folks and what we think is negotiable and non-negotiable in terms of responding to these. So, so quick refresher, Brian, and I I think every Mac is doing TPE right now, but but what are the thresholds and how are they working and and sort of the nuts and bolts here? Right. So so TPEs come in lots of different flavors from all those Macs, NGS, CGS, and Palmetto. They could relate to uh, routine home care, GIP, uh, focus on long length of stay, and other items. They've evolved through the years. Uh, you know, we've done been doing these for years. So these are not things that are going away. They are evolving over time. And the typical TPE is, starts with round one, where you're going to get uh, a letter that says, hey, you're on TPE. And then after that, you're going to get electronic notices or requests for records. Between 20 to 40 claims of documents they're going to be asking for. And I think more recently, it's trending closer to the 40 number of claims. Yeah, I haven't seen anyone get less than 40 in the last, I don't know, six months or a year. It just seems like really automatic. I think what they are still sticking to, except for new provider TPE, which is a whole nother thing, is they are not pulling typically all 40 in a month, like they are spacing it um, over several months. But I think 40 claims to do is still a lot in terms of cash flow delay. I mean, even if you get all your claims paid, right, you have whatever it is, 41 days to respond or 45 days to respond. And then they have 30 days to respond. I mean, suddenly your cash flow is starting to look fairly different if you have 40 claims now if you're a giant program that's going to have a different effect but we're seeing clients with the census of 150 200 still get 40 they're not necessarily doing something less because your census is smaller which to me seems somewhat unfair but say oh, yeah. me, i guess brian <laughs> it, yeah well yeah i mean it's another drain on resources and disproportionate but you know with with the pressure that cms is getting from congress uh, a lot of the pressure from enforcers this is another way where they're they're kind of taking it to the hilt and using tpes for all their worth in addition to expanding other kinds of audits that i'm sure we'll talk about in other podcasts so yeah. So these thresholds, which a- another thing that keeps scratching my head is, you know, if you're with Palmetto, you might be at a 15 percent threshold or 20 percent threshold to get off of TPE. But CGS, you're 25. So there's still I, I think, you know, why is one like a 10 percentage difference is, is pretty significant in terms of payment error rate. But I will say, I think because something that we have touched on in other podcasts and continues to unfortunately be a trend is the number of um, clients that are going to round two and round three TPE. And that I think clients have been able to truncate 
or get off of TPE if they've made significant improvement. Even if you're not exactly at that payment error threshold that they publish, which I think is good that Macs are looking at it. And because when you look at the guidance and the, the reworking of TPE from a number of years ago, they're really trying to focus on improvement. And like, I think having an arbitrary number shouldn't necessarily be what you're focused on. Like, oh, you're at 23% instead of 20%, but you brought it down from 60 or 70%, right? I mean, keeping people on, especially when they're pulling 40 every time is is a lot. So, Yeah, pull all the levers you can. I and mean, there's opportunities to advocate with the MAC about being close about what claims they're pulling. I mean, is it fair for them to keep pulling claims that are going to turn up the same errors, even though you've corrected an issue? I mean, there's something about the timing of the claims that they pull, where they're supposed to allow education to take hold and allow you to correct problems. But if it's like an election-related problem, you might not have an opportunity to correct that. So there may yeah. be opportunities. And, and Meg, I agree, it's these numbers are arbitrary. The, the 15, 20, or 25% error rate you've got to beat to get off of TPE. And the interactions with your Mac may be arbitrary as well. But but that doesn't mean don't try. You, the arbitrariness may come in your favor in some of these circumstances. So keep advocating. Yeah, I would say we have successfully gotten people off, even if they're not right at the threshold or even if they're not willing to like not go to a round two, they've cut round two short if you're doing well. So sometimes it can be helpful to use counsel in a very strategic way to sometimes do that reach out. I mean, you can ask for it yourself too, but again, TP is something I think you gotta build your infrastructure to try to handle the best you can internally, as opposed to use outside counsel. But with that said, the heart of this is we do have some tools if clients want to email us that are for TPE. So it's sort of a do-it-yourself kind of thing. And I think throughout my entire career, and I learned this from my mentor, Mary Michael, you always want to have like things that you make available to people for free, hence this podcast, or we, I've written a, a zillion toolkits in my lifetime, which I will never write another one. So <laughs> that is, um, you know, uh, not going to happen. But we wanted to make available to people some TPE tools, if they are on TPE, that they can sort of do it their, themselves. So folks listening who are interested in that, they can just email us and we can send those to them. But the first are some, I always think the gold standard, if you can do it, is to write a brief patient summary, one page that gets the highlight as to why this person is eligible for you know, hospice, if it's a routine home care kind of TPE or long length of stay or a level of care if it's GIP or continuous care. Um, but Brian, you and I worked on these. What What's the essence of this? How, how do you do anything that's worth doing in a page? Well, yeah, and, and I think it, it it depends upon getting right to the point. And for something like routine home care, if that's what they're reviewing because of length of stay, the fastest way to start speaking the language of the auditor is talk the LCD. You, you lay out some standards and then you immediately start applying the LCD and hopefully you can make an argument that the patient meets the LCD. That's the, the most persuasive way if you have that argument. That'd be the one you'd want to put in this one page, one and a half page document that you're submitting with the medical records. For GIP, when they're focusing on that, uh, it's getting right to the criteria for GIP, uh, pain control, symptom management at the end of a covered hospital stay, Require the patient requires medication adjustment, observation. Those are all taken right from the regulations or the manuals. So line up your facts against those and you could do the same thing for continuous home care if that becomes a subject. But get right to the standards, line up your facts, cite the pages, and uh, you know make it a real succinct submission. So 
I, I do think folks listening are like, I don't have time to do that. And I think if you're doing fine on TPE and you're trending in the right direction, then maybe making that investment is not helpful and you double down on just making sure your records are um responsive and ordered in an easy to use way and all that stuff. So I, I know in talking to a lot of clients over the last year about TPE, a lot of folks are not doing patient summaries. However, folks who are in a second or third round, they hadn't done patient summaries. I think that they're now, you know, trying to to put in that extra time to because I, I do think it can can make a difference because it, it is sort of a dot connecting kind of exercise. So people can take it or leave that. But I think the thing they can't take or leave is you got to get organized. And I, I just um, am finishing up the slides for a presentation I'm doing at NHPCO with Amanda Tippin at TrustBridge, and it's about sort of audit strategy and infrastructure. And one thing that we're really emphasizing in that presentation, I think the same goes with TPE, is you got to have a tracker from the very get-go. And, and what do I mean by tracker? It's an Excel spreadsheet that keeps track of all the patients being requested and how that follows through the appeal process. So you're not meeting deadlines, missing deadlines, or, you know, you, you don't understand how things are, are um, related to one another. So I think that's a non-negotiable. We've had clients who have missed some deadlines because they, they weren't organized. And so I think you got to front load that and have rigor around per TPE. And if you want to keep it on all one spreadsheet, yay, do that. But you got to, you want to have different tabs for different TPE, because I think one thing you and I deal with on sort of the program integrity type audits, which TPE is not that, is that have you, what is your education from Max Ben before and how have you, how have you fared in terms of, because right claim denials are considered education. So if you get everything overturned and let's say you have a, you pick audit three years from now, you'd want to be able to have that evidence like, hey, my claims have gotten reviewed before and I was told I was doing everything right. And so having, you know, something that you can, can track the final adjudication of a matter all the way to ALJ or whatever, I think is incredibly important. I'm passionate about that, Brian. If that's <laughs> not coming across, I'm passionate about being organized on that because you can't do anything if you're not organized, right? And you can't be strategic if you're not organized and you don't have good tracking tools, right? So well, that's that's exactly it. And, and we do these tracking tools when we're when we're uh, asked to help with clients, and they're invaluable. Uh, I, I have a number of hearings every month about uh, relating to TPEs, a number of ALJ hearings. And you go to a tracking tool and you can see, well, what were all the decisions before we got to ALJ? And what's the patient name, dates of service under review, the kind of it? And it's all at your fingertips. You build these from the beginning, and it doesn't become that onerous of a task. So you, you, it's a big spreadsheet, but you're filling in these columns and rows over weeks and months. And then when the time comes and you need it for that project, it's all there. And Meg, like you were saying, you get audited by an unrelated, by a, a program integrity auditor. You can use this information to your benefit there as well. So, yeah, I agree. Non-negotiable. Use that tracker. It's it's very important. Yeah, and so um, you know, and and then you're you can also track on a real time basis what's your payment error rate, right? That's a driver in all of these thresholds. Is what's your payment error rate? I mean, they track claim error rate, but you can have a claim error rate of a hundred percent and a payment error rate of two percent, right? Like people who got hit on physician visit denials or whatever, right? That's a very small amount of an overall GIP claim, but they got a lot of denials, so they had a really high uh, claim error rate, but their payment error rate, the percentage of that, quote, error is very small. 
and so our tracker has like a formula that sort of adds that up. Yeah, I, I went through that recently, and it was a, a, a kind of a real life example: a sixty percent claim error rate, and eleven percent payment error rate. So yeah, th those numbers are important. Dig into those numbers because the percentages may surprise you about how well you're doing despite the number of claims that could be denied. Yeah, so I guess take it from us, someone who we are managing hundreds and hundreds of audits, um, that the only way we can do that is we're really organized and have a lot of infrastructure and obviously you know, most folks aren't going to be managing hundreds of audits, but I think the how we do that in an efficient way is you have that infrastructure. And I think for for folks coming to NHPCO, you know, hopefully you can attend my session where we're going to talk about that sort of in more of the context of program integrity audits. But um you know, it, it all is somewhat the same as you got to put in the time, even if you're like, I don't have time to deal with this. I just got to respond to this. You have to prioritize building the infrastructure or else you're always chasing your tail and you're not building anything, right? You're just reinventing the wheel each and every time you do an audit and that's, that's or TPE. And so I, I think that's real, really inefficient. And for those CEOs who are listening, I think it's something you really need to to push your compliance folks to do and ask them that, you know, these questions of what infrastructure they have, because that's how you're going to be able to, you know, have high quality in terms of I'm always doing the things the same. And, you know, you're going to be able to to see at a glance where things are at and how you're faring. So so I will get off my soapbox now, Brian. And uh <laughs> Yeah, I think we all got the message. Yeah, we all got the message. This podcast, <laughs> but I, I'm just still surprised on how many clients I talk to who really still <laughs> sort of don't have a uniform method of doing that. And I, I think that, that that's really a mistake. I and agree. I, I don't say mistake yeah. very often, Brian. <laughs> no, that's it's like, often you know, <laughs> you could improve this or that. But yeah, yeah, this is one of the bright lines that, yeah, uh, that's out there. Yeah. So awesome. The world is all about data analytics. And if you don't track your own data with this, you're not going to be able to do any of your own analytics on, on your appeal. So, well, great conversation, Brian. And folks who want those tools, please reach out to us and we can email them over to you. Thanks for your time, Brian. And I bet I'm going to put chips on it that we're going to talk about TPE. Yeah. again in the future yeah thanks a lot meg probably so but uh it's always new information always good talking with you well that's it for today's episode of hospice insights the law and beyond thank you for joining the conversation to subscribe to our podcast visit our website at hushblackwell.com or sign up wherever you get your podcasts until next time may the wind be at your back 